It's my pleasure to act as a moderator for the final discussion. And uh, our two speakers are each going to talk for about 10 minutes, and then we'll have an open uh, question and answer session after that. And I'm going to introduce both of them now and then let them talk in succession. So the first speaker is Maite Zubia Ure, who is a professor in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese and the Department of Germanic Languages at UCLA. Her areas of expertise are comparative literature, gender studies, urban studies, cultural studies, modern and contemporary peninsular literature, European and particularly German and Latin American realism, Latin American women's fiction, and Latina and Chicana fiction. She's the author of The Space of the Realist Novel, Landscapes, Miniatures, and Perspectives from 2000, a book-link study of the dialectics of space and gender in European and Latin American realist fiction, and The Cultures of the Erotic, Spain, 1898 to 1939, and that's from 2012. This is the first scholarly monograph that analyzes the diverse visual and textual representations of the erotic in Spanish popular culture during the so-called Silver Age from 1898 to 1936. Michael Deere is Professor Emeritus of City and Regional Planning here at UC Berkeley and Honorary Professor in the Bartlett School of Planning at the University College London. Michael's current research focuses on comparative urbanism and the future of the US-Mexico borderlands. He is co-editor of a major volume on transdisciplinary work in geography and the humanities entitled Geo-Humanities, Geo Art, History, Text at the Edge of Place. He has recently taught courses on urban theory, the state, social theory, and the borderlands. His most recent book is entitled Why Walls Won't Work, Repairing the U.S.-Mexico Divide, and that's from 2013. So welcome to both our speakers, and Maite, I'm going to ask you to come up first and give your comments. So well, this has been an immense pleasure, and uh, so the first thing I want to do is to convey my gratitude for, oh sorry, let me just, I made a collage, which I'm very embarrassed about after seeing those absolutely magnificent exhibitions, but anyhow. <laughs> so, uh, so let me convey my gratitude for this wild roller coaster ride because that is what this symposium has been uh, for me. Un viaje frenético. I'm going to talk some Spanglish, but I, I'm, I think I made an effort so that everybody will understand. Un viaje frenético that takes us up and down at dizzying speed, a widely creative recorrido or journey, de los mejorcitos, of a mega city, a monster volatile and unpredictable, a veces consoladoramente apapachador, y otras furiosamente hostil, una megalópolis hecha con innumerables pedazos, made of many different pieces, piezas that sometimes move apart, fast and angry, and other times come together, clingy and anxious. Who knows how and why, but they do. Y luego, todo se nos desbarata otra vez. We are past la ciudad de los palacios y la región más transparente, or perhaps we are not. Rubén Gallo initiated our conference by forcefully stating that the illusion persists of El DF, and for that matter, of Mexican history at large, as a city blessed with completeness, wholeness, persistence, and solidity. Runes have been repressed from the imaginary and become strangely invisible. And yet, you cannot do a step in a lefe without stumbling upon a rune or the trace of one. Try to dig a hole on the ground, for example, as Juan Villoro points out in his musings about the Mexico City subway, I'm quoting, Underground constructions carry a powerful symbolic charge. In Mexico City, the concealed infrastructure of buildings always involves an accidental archaeology. I like that term. Foundations, telephonic cables, waste pipes, all have to work around the bird Aztec City. I wonder if it makes sense, and that's me now, in the case of El DF, to distinguish a <coughs> as Brian Thiel does in his 2015 book, Waste, between the rune and the derelict, between the rune as a thing of wonder and romantic grandeur, and the derelict, the, uh, that architectonic monstrosity or outgrowth that seems to cry out for burial or demolition. 
It is the difference, Till insists, between a majestic crumbling beauty and an eyesore, a hazard or a nuisance. Is the derelict as invisible as the room? My question to Rubén would be, because if you think about it, lo ruinoso y lo abandonado trigger diametrically different reactions in us. The rune invites contemplation and conservation. The derelict demands action and destruction. Runes, because they have been there for ages and for other complex ideological reasons, of course, fade into a landscape. And against that invisible background of a landscape, the derelict and yet not normalized and consecrated starkly stands out and begs for intervention. Is Pani's crumbling Tlatelolco, me, uh, Tlatelolco mega project <coughs> a rune or one more example of the derelict? In any case, the derelict makes us uneasy and prickly, and so does, famously, the experience of the urban now and then. Tatiana Flores, for example, muses about how many of the artists and writers ga uh, gathering around Manuel Marpel's Arce despite the vociferous fascination with modernity, resist the urge to ignore social inj uh, uh, injustice and uh, class struggle. <coughs> so something similar actually uh, still happens, somewhat detached also, uh, happens, uh, something similar happens, sorry, uh, I'm, I'm just, I wrote some stuff down and I'm trying to find what I said, okay. Uh, so, there is a certain degree of distance in estrientismo, as we know, and someone uh, detached also, there's some distance, and, the, the, and also the, the impulse to represent the megalopolis without the megalopolis inside. Uh, uh, when contemporary media artist Rafael Lozano Hemmer stages a public intervention in the Zócalo that, ironically enough, takes us away from the Zócalo and into the skies via 7,000 watt xenon lamps, Focus Xenon, xenon 7000 Watts, el título quizá de un poema de Maples Arce. In any case, otra vez no vemos las ruinas, otra vez no tocamos la piedra, otra vez nos perdemos en esas regiones donde dicen todo es transparencia. But then, the symposium and Tatiana Flores' talk and also Rubén Gallo's keynote make a sharp turn and go down fast. And we do see the runes, believe me, or the derelict, for we find ourselves scratching our hands with it and our lungs avidly inhaling the acrid dust que se desprende de todo lo abandonado y de todo lo ninguneado y también de todo lo inacabado y en vías de construcción, for that that is being built is yet another rune avant la lettre. We see the city because suddenly we see what we don't the never found bodies from Ayotzinapa, the blood on the walls of Tlatelolco, the sweat drenched labor in the revueltas andamios exteriores, and in the trabajadores del hierro, the steel workers, otros desaparecidos, más cuerpos invisibles, of Juan Carlos Rulfo's magnificent, magnificent and heart-wrenching documentary in El Hoyo that we have the privilege to watch yesterday. Yes, Rulfo, Gallo, and Flores take us deeper into Mexico City because they confront its social fabric and tragedy head on. Like Edward McGahan, who tells us how students involved in the 1968 student movement, artist collectives, feminists, and LGBT activists, gloriously muddle the waters and make irreverent dents in the severe edifice of orthodox, patriarchal, and rigidly gendered Mexicanidad. And like Daniel, Daniel Hernandez, who fearlessly takes us further down into the true gritty core of the Mexican megalopolis, able so far to resist the current flurry of cosmetic surgery uh, catering to artists, uh, to uh, tourists, for, uh, sorry. For how long though? And will they, more importantly, will LDF find its way into true and meaningful social transformations? The questions that we have been asking ourselves all the time. From El Hoyo, Jesús Rodríguez calls it El Hoyo Negro, La Boca Insaciable, and from so many hoyos in El DF, and so skillfully detected in this now concluding symposium, we move up again vertiginously, de la mano de Jesús Rodríguez, hasta la mera luna, desde la laguna de la luna, 
from a lake that is the navel of the moon, the lake where the Tenochtitlan floated, to the moon in the sky, and the rabbit in the moon in the sky. <coughs> El conejo está en la luna, Jesús tells us, but he is not, for the rabbit is wise and focused, in tune with the cold nature of things, whereas the moon is linked to drunkenness, menstruation, and the welling up of the ocean. The moon, a goddess clad in silver, que calienta, enrojece y dilata las cosas abajo en la tierra. The moon, cruel in its distance, however, as cool as the rabbit that inhabits it, looks down impassively, and down we go again, at 30,000 disappeared, at 200,000 dead, at thousands of mothers looking for their children and dying of sorrow themselves, at 49 babies burning to death in a daycare center, and at 43 students from whose bodies, uh, whose bodies cannot be found. Los cuatro jinetes del apocalipsis, corruption, impunity, dissimulation, and cynicism, ride through the detrito of the fecal and leave it drenched in blood. Somewhere along the symposium, Almo, almost from the get-go, I have to say, uh, the collage on the screen ceases to make any sense. Neither Mexico City nor the symposium is an estridentista photo montage of a moon entre estelizado y naif, home to a conejito. A derelict roller coaster standing on the ghostly waters that once mirrored the city of Tenochtitlan, and a subway like an orange arrow that shoots through the LDF's underground, takes home rule for steel workers and stopped at clean stations, thanks to Minerva Cuevas. No, this is not the collage that portrays El DF. This second, modified version, is more like it. Uh, and Minerva Cuevas, furiously passionate and compassionate art engagé, has been saying this from the very beginning, and even before she founded Mejor Vida Corporation in 1998. Gracias, Minerva. Uh, granted, El DF, La Experiencia del DF, is a roller coaster, though not the one transplanted from New Jersey I use for the photo montage thanks to the internet. Uh, what makes it truly roller coastish, however, a turbulent trip from hell to heaven and back, is not its stone and cement cartography and urban palpability, but its people, the dense social fabric similarly defined by an abundance of rooms, visible and invisible, erasures, hoyos, and the derelict. Let me conclude by saying that at UCLA, and as we embark in our Urban Humanities Mexico journey, Dana and Jonathan can attest to that, our path seamlessly blends with the tonica de este simposio. In our case also, initial reflections about urban ruins and physical erasures as a consequence of various disasters and their aftermaths have firmly redirected our thought towards spatial justice. The true derelict is people. People perceived as such, discarded and ninguneados. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maita. I wish I could speak Spanglish like Maita, so I, but I can't, so I won't. Um, you'll forgive me if I confine myself to English, which is probably my safest option. Um, it's, this, is a, this is the hardest job I've ever had in a conference because the variety and richness of the presentations has been so diverse, and there's been lots of moving testimony, which I, I can't really respond to. Um, I'm certainly not going to presume to speak to you um, about politics in Mexico. Um, this is not my, my skill. I'm a border person, um, and the border is not de Efe. I know that, and vice versa. Um, so I'm, I'm treading very carefully here, although it might not look it. I'm, I might look like my suave, sophisticated self, but in fact, I'm not. Um, the, qu the question, it seems to me, that we come down to in the end of all this is, you know, what is to be done about the situation that we find ourselves in? And whether one is, like me, a social scientist or an artist or a political activist, the question is the same. Um, the ends might differ uh, and the means might differ. Um, but I certainly feel convinced as a social scientist about the need to see clearly. So the, the, the point of departure for me is always to get some understanding and then to move from that to appropriate action. Of course, we can disagree about what appropriate action is, but that's the general trend that I want to be looking towards. What is to be done 
and we base that on knowing what the situation is. I'm going to make two series of observations. Um, there are many, many more that I could make, and um, that's, that's going to be due to the nature of place, which comes out very strongly in a lot of the, our presentations, but also the question of time, because I was very enamored of lots of aspects of time in our conversation. Um, both of those things, space and place and time, have a political dimension, which I will address along the way. I'm going to be very, very rude and um, start my conversation with Ruben Gallo. Um, I've warned him already that I was being an impolite host, um, and he said he didn't mind up to a point. Um, so we'll see, I hope I don't offend him. But in order not to focus entirely on him, I will also be going back to, uh, and talking about uh, Daniel Hernandez, um, who's, uh, situation whose discussion about loving Mexico City, I felt very strongly about because I too love Mexico um, and the city is a wonderful place. So let me try to encapsulate some of my concerns about some of the presentations. And this, this goes beyond Ruben, but this is the best example that, uh, that I can begin with. Um, let me just say this. I mean, De Efe is a special place and I love it. But then when we start looking at De Efe, through the ruins of the city. And then the ruins of the city is compared with somewhere else like Havana. It's then that my gears start to stop. I, I, don't, I can't go along with that, Ruben, I apologize, but I, but I will explain. See, the, the formal equivalence of looking at ruins does not derive from similar causality. There's a different socioeconomic political context operating in Cuba, from, done from Mexico. And I know a little bit about this because in 1976 I was in Havana just after it was opening up there to Canadians only at that time. Um, but the nostalgia I feel for Havana is quite different from the one that's been described in this, in this, in this situation. So I, I just don't see this. I, it does not com, com, compute with me to look at the common object, the common form, and to assume then that if, if the formality, if the forms are the same or they look the same, then the socioeconomic processes behind them are the same. They almost invariably are not. And so I can't buy the story of the Havana ruins and as it, as it applies to Mexico City. I certainly don't see Mexico City as a city of ruins, quite the reverse. So, forgive me, but that's a point of inquiry. That's my point of incision into this vast territory of conversations that we've had today. Let me, let me explain it further, and I'll move away from Ruben's presentation, but referring to a number of presentations, although not always by name. Um, see, the other thing, the other problem that I had is it was mentioned, I think Jesusa says this, um, that everything happens in Mexico City. Well, no, that's not true. An awful lot of what happens in Mexico happens in Mexico City, yes. But as a border person, I see the country completely differently. And I know the people who live in the border see the country differently. I know, too, that people in the FA don't know where the border is. Okay, so we, we're talking about different worlds there. I want to be very careful about the number of lessons we can draw from a particular place. There's a, there's a phrase in social sciences, it comes in studies of science called truth spots, truth spots. That is to say, the tendency to exaggerate our own examples into general laws, into general theories. I'm guilty as anybody else. Oh, I can't be five minutes. Might I give me her time? So I've got eight minutes? Yes, thank you. Um, the tendency to, uh, I forget, I'm teasing. Um, the tendency to exaggerate one's own experiences. Um, I've done it in LA, I've done it in the board, I've done it anywhere that I'm interested in, but you shouldn't do it. Um, <laughs> We don't get general laws about urbanism. We don't get general laws about geopolitics from looking at one city and one place. It was strange and odd to me that when I was listening to Daniel in his conversation about how you could reinvent yourself in Mexico City, how about it was dangerous and exciting, I just crossed out De Efe and put in LA. Because I think that everything that drew Daniel Hernandez to 
the FA drew me to Los Angeles many, many years ago. I still think the same way. I get the same buzz from both cities because I love the FA and I think LA is wonderful. So when we start talking about what are we drawn to, I, I'm, I'm thinking more and more about how, how important it is to look at the comparative dimensions and to try to understand that hope and promise and danger and rebirth is a common feature in all cities. That's what cities do. Now, having said that, just the, the, the word is caution with respect to the way we approach the lessons that we learn from a place. A place is a truth spot and so on. The, when, you, when, you, when we talked about the gay revolution in Mexico City, I don't expect to see that in the rest of Mexico. It doesn't happen, in my experience, in the rest of Mexico. And similarly, um, you know, when you look at the gay revolution in urban America, you look at Los Angeles and certain parts of LA very early on, as well as certain places in New York. So I'm, I'm really very concerned about the nature of these places and the kinds of politics they produce. So when we see a gay revolution spawned in West Hollywood or along the Castro Street in San Francisco or in the Stonewall situation in New York, recognize the specificity of the local politics. Now that's a lesson that several people have brought out today, but I also want to switch you out of the comfort zone. Because by some coincidence, I was uh, talking with Cortemo Cárdenas last night. Um, a former mayor of Mexico City and three-time presidential candidate and so on. He's part of and leading uh, a new social movement in Mexico called Por Mexico Hoy, for Mexico Today. Now that's a very interesting movement because it's not directed at any political party. It's not indeed directed at anything connected with electoral politics. Right? It's, a, it's a movement to try to get encouragement amongst a vast variety of people about the need for social change, in particular for rewriting the Constitution in Mexico and to reform the judicial process. Those aspects, I think, are extremely convincing. It's also interesting that in this conversation, I don't think that many young people liked what Cardenas had to say. But it is his job, and he knew this, to talk to these people and to get them on side. The, the, the point here is not that we can only act at the local level, and we can, but also these broader national movements are really important. So the, the scale question, the space question becomes preeminent under those situations to me. You can talk about the right to the city, and in Por Mexico hoy, that's part of the platform. Now, putting it in a platform is not the end of the story, you understand, but I think in terms of re reconceptualizing local politics and national politics, don't forget any of those dimensions, the national, global, and the, the local scale. I can say more about this, but I, I want to pass on because time is going on. Um, just briefly then, let me also talk a little bit for a second about time. Um, the spatial dimension, the geographic di geographical dimensions and politics is important, but so is the time dimension. I love the way a lot of our Mexican guests went into the deep past. Um, Gaston talked about uh, Bonfil Betaya's work on Mexico Profundo, Mexico Imaginario. What he didn't talk about and the others didn't talk about is Mexico Global or Mexico Mundial. I'm not quite sure what the better Spanish word is there. Um, because the, t the, the situation about looking back into the deep past for Mexico's roots is totally understandable, and I'm, I'm completely persuaded by it. I'm also completed by the notion, uh, compelled by the notion of Mexico Imaginario, you know, the, the, the idea of looking towards a European period uh, for our roots there, a post-colonial period now, and so on, to understand that modernistic impetus in Mexico. But we've gone past that. We've already gone past that, and when we start thinking about, when we start thinking about uh, what to do in politics now, I mean, I, th I think we, 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 we really have to change our perspectives and change our scales. Um, with all due respect to Jesus and others who have who, who spoken about this, local outcomes are important, but so are national and international perspectives. It's a multipolar world. And the United States has a lot of things wrong with it, but it's not the sole culprit in the world right now. 
I, I say this as somebody who lived through the, 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 the Cold War era in Europe when everybody blamed the United States for everything, me included. Okay, I, I think the situation has changed. And if you take a look at what's happening in uh, Syria, if you take a look at what's happening in China, if you take a look at what's happening in Russia, I think you'll find it persuasive. So Mexico Global, Mexico Mundial, it should be an important part of our considerations too. I'll, I'll stop because my time's up, but I'll just say one sentence more. A very long sentence. I'll just say one sentence more. Um, you see, see, what I'm getting at is, is not, in a sense, disputing things, although I do dispute quite a number of the interpretations that have gone on today. Um, but, my, but the thrust of my concern is that we get things as right as we can in order to act as best as we can. This is why I'm excited about the conversations. I mean, the, the, the initiatives that we are engaging with our friends at UCLA and at Berkeley and now with you, it's so important to me and it's so exciting and interesting to me to bring together transdisciplinary scholars, such as Maita and others, and people who are actually working in arts and culture and politics in Mexico. It's, it's, it's wonderful for me since I'm vaguely a Mexican, Mexicanist as well. Um, but bringing the voices together is the most important thing that can happen because in terms of refining my own ideas, for example, responding to Ruben and thinking, you know, I think you've got it wrong, <laughs> you know, makes me actually contemplate better what I'm doing. I think, the, I think the coming together of various disciplines in the university, various with people outside the university, especially frontline people, activists, is the best thing that's happened. And the conversations that we've had today only reinforce me in this belief that what, we, what we're trying to do is a good thing. Thank you for listening. <laughs>
the, the, the attempt to think of these two cities together came out of a very personal meditation, you know, of moving between these two countries and seeing things get better in one, in Cuba. You know, there's a notable optimism. You know, people look at the future and they, they feel that things can only get better. And going to Mexico City where it's the exact opposite. You know, there's a bleakness that I think came out in the presentations of, you know, things being very bad and no real solution in sight. So, you know, my talk from a humanist point of view was about trying to make sense of these very disparate realities and comparing it. And, um, you know, I don't think I, I was trying to get things right. That was really not my intention because I don't think um, one can in this, in this sense. I wouldn't say for one moment that you were trying to get things right, and I don't want to exaggerate the, the strength of numbers. Um, but I, do th I did think, and I still think, I think, um, that you were led into some false conclusions about Mexico City because of your a city of ruins. It's not. I don't think so. Um, and I think that I'm, I'm guessing now, Ruben, so forgive me. I mean, by, by making a comparative approach to Havana, which is a, which is a good sensible movement, um, since I believe in comparative work, but then you, you, you imported ideas about Mexico City that I thought didn't gain currency, didn't gain traction in my mind. That was my complaint. Um, yes, well, you know, I would defend the idea of thinking about Mexico City as a city of ruins. I actually, I think it's a healthier way to think of it than as this pristine, globalized, world capital of the 11th economy, economy in the world. You know, in my sense, there's a an occultation, as I try to argue, that comes with that image. You know, whereas for me, the city of ruins, you know, it's not so much seeing, you know, physically collapsed building, it's the idea of a city that basically acknowledges its failures. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what um, I was trying to get at. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Just be I insist on the derelict. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I insist I mean, on the derelict. No, I, do, I do think, I do agree with Ruben. I do think that Mexico, in many ways, it is a city of ruins. And to be more, perhaps, perhaps a la a more precise a la social sciences, I would say it is both. It is a global city with neighborhoods that evidently speak to globalism and with many areas that don't and probably look much more like La Havana, a city that I unfortunately don't know, but I would like to go. So that's my contribution to the, to the discussion. I don't think these two opinions actually uh, essentially uh, contradict each other. Dana. <laughs> or maybe it's fine. This is a slight change of subject. Um, I want to thank all the speakers. It's been an extremely interesting day, and not a typical day on the academic field. And that's been, I've really appreciated that. But it's also made me wonder about our next engagement uh, at UCLA and probably also at Berkeley. Um, as we head to Mexico City, where every action is fraught with the political, and I think uh, today's um, uh, seminars really demonstrated the power that the arts can have in that context, I'm not so sure I'm clear about what the power of scholarship is in that context. And so I'm interested to see whether our positioning of something like an engaged scholar or an activist scholar is something that the uh, people who spoke today think is plausible or not. Or the people sitting at the table. Well, I do think that a political engagement is absolutely necessary and that it actually gives value and gravitas to our intellectual endeavors. Uh, of course, one can overdo it if you want or not. So I actually liked what uh, Minerva said, and I'm going to do it from now on, which is todos los días una pequeña desobediencia, <laughs> o grande, <laughs> as, as the situation demands, right? So we should, in fact, I have to say, and I come from a quite revolutionary tradition, if you want. Uh, I grew up during a dictatorship. I witnessed the transition into a democracy. 
And one of my cherished memories from that time is actually the sense, the enabling sense of freedom and the efficacy actually of freedom. And also to have actually studied at a university, La Complutense, that reminds me dearly of La UNAM, and I'm where, where I taught, and I'm proud of both, where campuses are free territories, where you really have this freedom of expression. And I think we should hold on to that de forma constantemente desobediente. So a tamed scholarship, if it's too tamed, is not attractive. And it's not attractive intellectually either, because it loses all its intellectual poignancy. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah. Back. Uh, sort of two comments. So the first one was what really struck me today was the idea that there is the coexistence of several regimes of truth. There's the poetic truth that was brought forward so beautifully by Jesusa, and there is a social scientific truth. And truth, capital T, sort of lies in between all of these regimes somewhere. Um, and another thing, um, sort of in defense of the statement, everything happens in the FA, in the poetic sense, that statement also contains nothing happens in the FA. And so I think like the poetic truth is, is so expansive um, and it's a place that we can, we can deal with contradiction and disagreement and tension. So I just want to thank all of the speakers for um, filling the room with all these, all these truths. So. Look, I, I, don't, I don't want you to run away with the impression that I believe there's a big truth out there and that you can put a number on it. Um, it's not like saying 42 is the answer to everything in the universe. Um, but on the other hand, what concerns me most, and this has been exercising me ever since we started this project two or three years ago, is how do we judge the value of what we know? Okay, so um, Ruben, I totally agree with you with the humanistic perspectives that you bring to the conversation. This is why I'm in this room. Um, but I'm struggling to bring my own standards, my own practices to meet yours. I mean, I mean humanist, human, 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 humanity scholars generally. There's nothing wrong with what we do, and there is a variety of various perspectives that are all of value. But I'm very concerned with, and this may seem esoteric to some of you, how we judge those outcomes. What is the result of our coming together? I mean, do we produce something that's more intelligent and better knowledge, however defined, or do we actually um, destroy? Um, what we're doing. I mean, I'm not going to mention this person, although she's a brilliant Mexican scholar and has just done a lovely book on Mexico as Tenochtitlan and now Mexico City. Um, Barbara Mundy is her name, but I won't mention it. Um, you know, she's, she does fantastically good work. Um, but this latest book that's come at zero, have I got to stop? Oh, wait a sec. Um, the, the, the latest book um, co co goes off into social theory, hum humanities kind of theory, theorizing, De Sarto, Lefebvre, and so on, which I think is great, but is totally useless in the book. It's not needed. The book stands on its own in terms of its evidence, not with its theoretical trappings. It's that that, and, and don't, don't tell her I said this, because I think she's, she's wonderful, but that's a waste of time. Stathis. Um, I just want to respond to the question about what is the, uh, the agency of scholarship or what are we doing in terms of uh, scholarship. Um, and, and I wanted to, to start by saying that there, I felt, um, there's, I feel fundamentally um, uncomfortable with the idea of disobedience. As a, as a kind of activist uh, stance. And, and I feel uncomfortable because there was a sign on the door that said no food or drinks inside. And, and almost everyone uh, engaged, I mean, was disobedient of that. But, but uh, so, and I don't think that that actually did, that. well, I did, I guess it did change the, uh, the de facto, uh, the, the rule. But 
I mean, I, I felt very bad inside of me to, to, diso to be disobedient. And I was uh, kind of feeling that, but, but at the same time, I think I thought a lot of the work that we saw today um, it was very, very political at, in another, at another level that I actually spoke to me much more deeply. And, it, and I think it had to do with the idea of, of appropriation, of, of kind of like taking in uh, an understanding of kind of visuals, or an, uh, the city, the actual materials, the, the uh, systems of, uh, of uh, representation, digesting it and spitting it out uh, and, and as a, in different forms. And I thought that that was actually very, very, um, very significant for me. And I'm not so familiar with Mexico City, so maybe that was, that, that's why I was perhaps uh, so interested in, in those practices. Um, but but I, I wanted to also say something about the, uh, the, the ruination, the, the, ru the ruin. And I found that actually very interesting as an idea, not so much as the ruin as an artifact, but as part of a process, the process of ruination, which has a lot to do in my opinion, well, in the way I, I was kind of thinking of it, with the idea of scale, but not as a static thing, but as a scaling, as a process of scaling. So scaling and ruination were two uh, very interesting concepts that I was kind of thinking through as I was listening to the speakers. So, so I mean, in, in a way, I thought, I don't, know, I, don't, I don't want to be in academia in order to go out and become an activist. <laughs> I, I would do that if I, if I wanted to do that, but I'm here more in, because I want to synthesize and, and understand the processes that produce. Uh, what's happening? So, so I guess that's where I'm coming from. You can, of course, do both. <laughs> I was saying that he could, of course, do both, be a synthesizer and an activist. Uh, that's what I was going to say, that I feel like the transdisciplinary challenge is stepping into the unknown, but it's also collaborating, right? So surely as academics, we collaborate with activists. Sometimes we step into territories we don't expect and go with them, and sometimes they step into our territories, right? So I feel like that challenge of, of what you're articulating about how do we find value in all these different versions of um, thinking is also the transdisciplinary challenge in general. How do we step into the unknown and take people with us? In the corner there, it's Azusa. ¿Quién me puede ayudar a traducir? No? Solo para decir que creo que hay momentos en la vida en donde hay que ponerse a hacer las cosas a, aunque no quieras. So there's some moments in life where one has to sit down and do things even without wanting to. Y que este es un momento en que si los humanos no nos damos cuenta que el agua se está retirando y el tsunami va a venir, estamos bien idiotas. <laughs> So this is a moment where if we don't realize as uh, the whole humanity that the water is receding away and the tsunami is coming, we are a bunch of idiots. Entonces, yo creo que ahora, si no nos comportamos como los animales y como las plantas y dejamos en la razón o empezamos a sospechar de la razón, pues nos va a pasar lo que en el tsunami van a morir muchos humanos y los animales... Se van a salvar. So if we don't take the example of plants and just follow our instincts, then we might as well, we will have the same fate as in the tsunami and uh, just be swept away and dead, whereas other organisms will be alive. I do agree with that, and lately in, uh, in the area actually of diversity, I am now, I have an administration position that is related to diversity. What bothers me is what I hear, what, where is the solution to, to the lack of diversity or the deep inequity issues that actually uh, soil all our campuses, et cetera, et cetera. Berkeley and UCLA, actually, the, the whole UC system uh, included. And so we have all these diversity uh, authorities talking about this and saying, uh, we are on a, on a campus, we are a great university, we are smart people, our smarts will solve the problem. I mean, we are smart enough to know that smart people 
have done, are doing, and will do horrific things. So what Jesus is doing right now is resonating with me. But because yes, perhaps we need the intelligence of un animal, una planta. Perhaps we need that to get out of the trap of the ra 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 the la razón. Uh, will reason will solve everything. Well, there are certain things that reason has not solved, and it's time, really, to find other ways. <laughs> Any other questions? I would like to clarify something about Bonfil Batalla. <clears throat> I think Bonfil Batalla is not about returning to the past, neither the work of Jesusa. I think it's about Mexico, global Mexico, taking into account diversity. And diversity is in tradition. And tradition is in the past. So tradition is alive. And the past is alive. And that's, that's why I think Bonfil Batalla was so important. And I think we need to remember that Bonfil Batalla did the first important studies on migration, indigenous communities in the US. That was in the 1980s. So he was thinking in globalization at that time. Um, and I think sometimes that sounds contradiction, but contradictory, but you can think El Ejército de Zapatista de Liberación Nacional, SZLN, they use internet as part of the main tool uh, for uh, the revolution. But we know in Mexico, not everyone uh, has internet access. So these two things are happening at the same time. The past is not a pyramid. The indigenous are alive. Some of them, they have cellular phones. Some of them, they don't. So I think the contradiction sounds contradictory, but the past is alive. And I think this is something very important from Bonfil Batalla. No, I, I don't doubt that for one moment, Gaston, um, because when um, Ruben talked about the Templo Mayor, for example, um, or uh, Daniel talked about Tanachilan, and Jehusa talked uh, about Quiquico, I love that. I mean, that makes an awful lot of sense to me as a human being, but as also a, you know, as a Mexican, Mexicanist. Um, my, my point about making that appeal is not that it's wrong or it's somehow misconceived or mis maybe I didn't present it properly, but I, I, I wanted by insisting on moving to Mexico Mundial or Mexico Global to change the scale at which Mexican issues, US issues were being considered. Um, and especially in a, in a political realm. I mean, the geopolitical scene has moved dramatically in the last 20 or 30 years. That's what I'm kind of getting at. Um, I, I agree with what you were saying, um, and maybe I didn't have enough time or didn't make uh, myself clear, but, but changing that emphasis based on Bonfi Baitaya's ideas, I thought was, was an, it's an important part of the way I'm thinking about the issue anyway. But thank you for clarifying that. I think we're almost at the end. I'd like to ask Maite if you want to make, uh, add something to what Michael's just said or make a, a final comment before we start. Um, well, no, I don't think so. I, I really, I understand that, and I, I, I think your point is well taken when you say that the fact that we would do uh, intervene locally doesn't mean that we should ignore the fact that things happen at various levels, right? So, I mean, it happens at the level of the state, it happens at the level of globalism in its broadest terms. And then what is happening also is there's a lot of local interventions. Uh, that's essentially true. But I do think that, dada nuestra impotencia general, <laughs> the only thing we can really do and where we have, there's a point where we have to start doing things, it's locally and then influence uh, widely. So, and Again, this is a time where because of the internet and because of the social media, because we have this at the same time uh, liberatory or, 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 or freeing and at the same time constricted huge uh, communicative device, the local 
becomes automatically global. Whatever little intervention is going on in whatever lost village, everybody will know. So there's a point where, where do you distinct, uh, distinguish between the local and the global? There's a point where the local, be uh, the local becomes global and the global becomes local. So we should not forget that, you know? So, and many exciting things are happening locally because we know we can communicate and go beyond locality and we're learning how many uh, people are actually are acting uh, locally. So even our students with their wonderful uh, projects about community work, et cetera, et cetera, are actually hinting at that. So participatory, uh, actually participatory uh, spatial projects, et cetera, et cetera. So the global is local, the local is global at this point. I think that's an excellent point on which to conclude, and I want to thank our two discussants for some very provocative and interesting comments and a great session in the, to draw the day to a close.